So if you'll open your Bibles tonight to Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. You looking for your Bible, Tyler? And I'd like us to do a little mental time travel here and think about the very early church. You know, right after the ascension, the early church started really like a commune. Everybody was living together. And you know, the Roman Empire had a lot of issues in the Republic. And part of the efforts to hold the Republic together of all these people with differing languages, differing cultures, differing rituals, and most of all, competing interests, this government of Rome attempted to start off by controlling religion. Now the Romans knew that they couldn't get all these people together and just abolish their religion, just pull out the rug from underneath of them. So as this government attempted to influence and control these differing peoples and groups, their religions, it sought to somewhat validate them. It's really interesting, if you look at these pantheistic religions, whether it be Hinduism, be it the Norse religions, whether it be the Greeks or the Romans, you find these common themes that seem to repeat over and over and over again. In majority of the areas that Rome conquered, it was, they were pantheist societies. So what they did to influence this, they said, what we'll do is if you sacrifice to your gods, we will take that as a sacrifice to one of our similar gods. For instance, if you were, I believe the Greeks worshipped Zeus, I think that's who it was, and the Romans worshipped Jupiter. So if you were Greek and you made a sacrifice to Zeus, we would accept that as a sacrifice to Jupiter. Now the Jews, this presented a bit of a problem for Rome. The Jews would not have any part of this idea that if they sacrificed to God, that it was a sacrifice to Jupiter. Kind of threw a monkey wrenches in Rome's plans. They would not accept any sacrifice to Yahweh as equal to or a part of or in proxy to these other pagan gods. Another interesting thing about this old world mindset that really seems bizarre to us today is that majority of these groups and people they almost believe that if you were a military strength and you conquered another people, that you really had right to their land. And you see this over and over and over again, and honestly, it doesn't make sense in the West here, but I think that if you go outside of the West, many cultures even today would probably see this as being just the way it is. Not necessarily that it's right but it's just the way it is. If you conquer another people, you have the right to their land. Doesn't fit in the Western mindset, but I think we forget many times, especially in America, that our mindsets are not the way the rest of the world is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we did that. Yep. Yep. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. We did it, yet today we look back and say, we shouldn't have done that. that who, why did we have the right? And you even have groups today that say that, you know, America is illegitimate because we did that. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that, honestly, this is how the world has been throughout all of history. So now this presented another issue for the Jews in being inside of Rome. 
is that they did not hold to this idea that if you conquer us, that you have right to our land. Because they believed that their land was given to them by God. And you had no right to take from them what God gave them. Now, if you look at the Jews during Roman times, and depending on who you read and who you look up, you find that the Jews were actually almost 10% of this population within their area of Rome. And they were always a problem for Rome because you had basically three different people that were problematic. You had people that did revolts like the Zealots. And you can think of groups in America today that do violent protests. Or even you can think back to the issues in uh, England and between Ireland and the IRA, you know, doing bombings and, you know, just this, this group of people that could be very violent, very volatile. And this is kind of like what the Zealots were. And then you had these people that were rebellious but passive. And these were the Essenes. You could think of them like the hippies, that you couldn't control them because they just did their own thing. And they were separatists, and they were kind of, and this seems odd because you could say they were like the hippies in one aspect, but you could also say they were kind of like the Amish. The Amish don't vote, vote they do not participate in many of the things that our government puts off. Or you might even think of these groups of the Essenes like the people that are off-gridders today. They don't fit neatly into what Rome wanted into their society. And then you had another group of the Jews. And you could think of these people like complaining pot stirrers. This was the Pharisees. They had somewhat acceptance of Rome but in their acceptance and in their participation within the government, they were constantly complaining and causing turmoil and aggravating their governors of the people. Now, when Christianity began, Christianity was seen by Rome as just a sect within Judaism. And honestly, many of these converts from Judaism into what was the very early church. They were zealots. And Rome had no idea what to do with this growing movement of Christianity in Rome. So what Rome decided to do, what any good representative democracy would do, they persecuted the church. That was their only answer. And as many of the first believers were Jews, they were disowned by their own people for following Jesus. And in Jerusalem, they were left with pretty much no other choice than to go to communal, commune-type living. They were persecuted by the government. They were disowned by their family. And there was nothing left other than their church families. There was no other place for them to go other than to live in the church. Now in the rest of the Roman Empire, churches were starting up. And not being Jews and not living in Jerusalem, many of these people were from pagan families. And the stresses of outside of Jerusalem for the church, it was bad, but it wasn't as bad as like in Jerusalem. Because the early churches that were outside of Jerusalem, they did not have to live in so much of a communal society. They would live in what I would call a community type society. They would still live close to each other. They would meet in house churches. And this is what we read about like in the book of Philemon. And Paul tonight, as we are studying 1 Timothy, is talking about 
churches in this community type living of the church. And he's seeking to give Timothy, this young man that is becoming pastor, common sense instructions. And we know what they say about common sense, it's not so common. But as the early church was progressing from this communal living, everybody living under one tent, to community living, there was an importance to keep things decent and in order. So let's dive in tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. One of my favorite phrases is that wisdom is either learned or it's earned. Either we learn from other people or we do the stupid thing and we earn our stripes. We pay the stupid tax, as they say. And there is wisdom that is in older people that they have gained just by life experience. It's really easy as a young person to learn something and to think that you know better than somebody that has experience. I think every, t every person that has been in their 20s or later teens has this feeling. I've learned this, I must know better than these people, these old fuddy-duddies. And there's times that these people, these young people, they learn something and they may actually be correct. However, there's something more than just experience and there is something more than just knowledge and there's something more than just wisdom. There is also something called skill which is something altogether different. You could study to do any kind of skill, and the process you learn of that skill may be absolutely perfect. We may take something like hitting a baseball. You could get books, study internet articles, study everything on how to stand right to swing a baseball bat, how to connect correctly, all these things, and you could learn those things. And you may step up to the plate that first time, and you may be able to stand in the right stance, and you might even be able to connect with the ball and hit it, and maybe it goes to the infield, maybe it even hits the outfield. And then there will be somebody that will come up, and they've not been given all this instruction and stuff, but they've hit baseballs a long time of their life. And they step up to the plate and their stance looks all wrong. Their swing looks funny, yet they whack that ball and it completely leaves the field. Because they've developed a skill, not just knowledge of this thing. And even though it looks funny and unorthodox, they have developed something that is only gained from experience. For the experienced person, they have skill that has been earned and is of value, even if their approach was not what other people might consider correct. And when we're talking about dealing with our elders, many times they have learned and earned knowledge and sometimes they may not even have the knowledge, yet they have some skill just by life's experience. And in honoring the older men, we have to take as younger men, or you all have to take as a younger man, because I consider myself an older man now. <laughs> we have to take humility that although these people that are older than us may not always be correct, but they have something that we do not, as younger people, possess just by life's experience. Young men, we treat as brothers with respect, knowing that they are just trying to figure everything out as we are when we're young. 
And we treat older women as mothers, knowing that mothers have a unique and dynamic viewpoint that men, regardless of ages, really have any idea about. There is female intuition that I think, honestly, is given to them by God. So we treat older women as mothers, knowing that they have insights that we often miss. And young women we treat as sisters, holding young women in respect and purity, but also as the church, it is our responsibility as a body of believers to also protect the young women and young men as fathers and mothers and brothers would. Verse 3, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially the members of his household, <clears throat> he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Widowhood was a major issue in the old world. Women, for the large portion during this time, they could not own land. Their opportunities for earning income were very, very small. And it was impossible for women under the Roman Empire to be able to, to support themselves. Now, as the church is leaving the communal living of Jerusalem and moving more to the rest of Rome into community-style living, women still needed to have some structure of how they were going to be supported. Now, in America today, this is not as much of an issue as far as women can earn li uh, a living, they can own land, they are given rights. So I think we have to look kind of to what's the principle here that Paul is teaching about. I think we need to really look at what's the principle to find the application. Because women today, they have 401ks and they can be very self-sufficient. But they were the most impoverished people of Timothy's day. Now we should still, by principle, honor the impoverished. But kind of like Paul is saying here, the widows that are truly widows, we should honor the impoverished, yet if they are truly impoverished. We should also take care of our families. It is the family's responsibility first. A person's family are the first ones that are responsible to help those that have fallen on hard times. And we are to show godliness within our own households. Now, if we fall into poverty or we meet people that fall into poverty, I think we should follow these widow rules that Paul's laying out here. The people that fall into these, they should not be self-indulgent. They should be committed to prayer and they are to live without reproach in their poverty. There was an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond. We love that show that Robert, who's the older brother, he falls in some hard times. And Deborah and Raymond, they figure they're gonna help out Ray's brother. So they give him $1,000. He was eating bologna pie because he couldn't afford to feed himself. So he gets this check for $1,000 and he decides he's gonna to go to Las Vegas to gamble. 
and as you can see where this episode's going. But we should have this view. You know, America today are poor. They have nice cell phones. Many of them live in fairly nice housing. They have cars. You know, we, in my teenage years, we, we grew up in a um, townhouse community that they had moved a bunch of families in that were on housing assistance. And it's unbelieving, the, uh, unbelievable the lifestyles that people in America can live on welfare and housing assistance. They drove not brand new cars, but fairly nice cars. Some of them had nicer cars than we did. When we as the church are looking out for our impoverished and poor, we should really be looking, are these people living self-indulgent lives? Are they being committed to prayer in their situation? And are they living above reproach? And is their family there to take care of them? And if their family are believers, we should keep in mind verse 8, because they're probably, we're in rights to rebuke them. If their family are believers and they're not taking care of their family, Verse 8 says this, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially the members of, members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, Paul's not, Paul's not saying that they've lost their salvation over this. Absolutely not. But their behavior and their repercussions are worse than if they were never saved at all for this. Verse 9, let a widow be enrolled in if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been a wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that, they, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Absolutely, caring for the poor is a commandment of Scripture. One of the things that the church is to do. However, Paul is very much warning that taking care of the poor is not the primary mission of the church. In the church assisting people that are impoverished and of need is not without preconditions. We don't give money away to people that don't really need it. Also, the needy that the church helps, they should also be the people that are devoted to the church. And I'll say a few things that I think might rub some people the wrong way, but this idea that the church should gather big amounts of money and that we should be, you know, trying to fundraise and all these things, I think is wrong many times. Not all the time, but a lot of times. The church should really run as lean as possible as far as money. The church is not a welfare program. And even more today in America where we have all the welfare programs that raise people up, the church needs less money to do these things. The church is not a welfare program. It tends to the spiritual needs of people first and foremost. The church does not exist to just ease people's hardships. 
But truly, we have to see that all life's problems are spiritual problems. Many times people that enter into poverty, it is a spiritual problem. Giving them money is not going to ease their spiritual problem. It's not going to fix their issue. Now, we work to correct issues that are at hand. But we know this, that man is designed to operate spirit, soul, and body. When we're out of this order, running by the natural man's way of operating by the body, then the soul, and then to a dead spirit. Only bad things come from this. It is the root of where poverty comes from. Poverty without joy, I should say. Because we've talked many times that there are blessings of poverty that God brings into our lives. There's also blessings financially in prosperity teachings that are absolutely true. And it's not that people that speak about prosperity in church that they're wrong. They're just not balanced with te uh, also teaching the fact that God brings calamity and affliction and things into your lives to wake you up. And even as Timothy is, we're going to read here in a little bit, Timothy has a physical ailment. Paul tells him to drink a little wine for his stomach. Timothy is not ever noted as begging God to remove this from him. He's living in this adversity, probably, and this is conjecture, but probably along the same lines as Paul lived with his thorn in the flesh, knowing that there are things far greater, and that is spiritual, because many times when we have problems, our first reaction is, my body hurts. My mind doesn't like it. And we ask God to take it from us. But if we're looking at it from the spiritual first, God tells us, this is necessary for you. And our mind deals with it. And it's not that the pain goes away, but we know the reason of it, that God has a purpose in this infirmity in my life. Let the elders who rule be rule let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads grain treads out the grain, and a labor deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against any elder except on evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Now, our pastors here are not paid. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with pastors being paid. If a church grows to a point that it is a full-time position and they're working, they should be paid. I don't believe that pastors really should be living extravagant lifestyles. And I think the double portion that Paul is talking about is blessings of financial and then blessings of the spiritual from the body. That it's not that if the average wage is $50,000, a pastor should make 100. But we here don't ask for money because of what I said earlier. We believe that a church should really run lean. We should be there to provide and spiritual things first. But this double portion truly is more than money. It's encouraging the pastor. It's building him up. Building him up in the spirit. 
Verse 22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going after them to judge, but the sins of others appear later. So also the good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. We've all seen people that they get saved Sunday. They want to, by Wednesday night, they want to be a part of the children's school ministry. They go into the Sunday school class, the kids are ruffians, and by Wednesday night, they're out of this. We should not be quick to lay, people, uh, lay hands or to give positions to people that are new believers in the church. There is a time of growth that is necessary. We should be very slow and very careful. And in prayer, know that it is this person's right time to enter in these things. And there's also an idea here that, quite frankly, because it uses the word conspicuous, which is kind of a funny word. There is a time that our sins they can be hidden for a short time, and then they come out in there for all to see. There's also a time that our good works, they don't show fruit immediately, but then also they come out and are for all to see. As we close, you know, the church has changed quite a bit since the early commune, within Jerusalem, the early house churches in Rome. You know, we've built great cathedrals. We've built hospitals. We have homeless shelters. The education system in America was largely built on churches. And these are all good. But we can have beautiful buildings. We can feed every starving person. We can tend to every sickness and forget the Great Commission to spread the gospel. That truly the greatest need in everybody's life is not how much money they have, not how nice their house is, but their spiritual need and their need for God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Apply these things to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.